I want to do a video about uh, just to share a little bit about why I believe the way I do um, a little bit of my background and some of the things I've went through that have led to the way I believe now I didn't uh, I didn't I wasn't born obviously believing the way I do I wasn't uh, taught by my family or parents or whatever to believe the way I do uh, it's actually a miracle I believe in anything um, I once heard a uh, a man say well there was all there was a point in time when we all when we when there was a point in time when we didn't when all of us didn't believe in God at all um, I thought about that, and when I heard that statement, I thought about it, and I realized that there wasn't really any time in my life when I didn't believe in God. It's just uh, kind of a fact of life growing up for me. Uh, I never gave it much thought, aside from the usual thing a lot of us went through, being sent off to Sunday school and uh, the stuff they, they teach you there. Um, I was, uh, I'll go back a little bit and give a brief history of where I come from. I was born in, in Quebec, um, but I was raised uh, English from my mother. My mom and dad divorced when I was like five, I think, and I was raised. Uh, my mom then left my dad and moved to Ontario here in uh, Ontario, Canada, where um, we lived in, uh, for a long time we lived in housing. Uh, housing was a relatively new thing. And she was on like what's called we call mother's allowance, so we weren't living high off the hog. We were pretty, we, were, we weren't, we weren't living too good. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't rich, that's what that way. Um, but you know, we got by. Uh, like most children, I was raised. We celebrated all the usual uh, traditions that uh, everybody has in our country. We had uh, Christmas and Easter and the whole nine yards. And, and again, I never gave it any thought. You just believe what you're told. You know, when you're a child, you believe in Santa Claus and flying reindeer. Um, the you know, guided by the fat rat, fat elf in, in in his pajamas. And uh, you just you just don't think about it you do you pick you believe what your parents tell you because your parents know what they're talking about right and uh, they, every Sunday my parents sent us off to Sunday school um, we had a bus that even came around and picked us up for that actually uh, you went to Sunday school you learned about the little Lord Jesus away in the manger you, you, you sang the song uh, yes Jesus loves me a lot <laughs> I think we'll have that one memorized and uh, I don't know that's about it they really they don't really learn a lot from Sunday schools uh, really aside from just the usual um, and yeah I didn't learn a lot there uh, and a matter of fact I found it extremely boring especially the main church services I got, as I got older in my teens uh, early teens uh, we went to Sunday school and then we actually I remember us attending the uh, the, the church services you know which was separate from the Sunday school and uh, they, I used to just get bored to tears in them uh, we were we lived I don't know what the exact distance was I think it was about three miles from the church um, it's at a little town a small town and the church was on one end of the town and we were living at the complete other end of it so it was, it was a good trip but church, the church service main church services used to bore me so bad i used to actually instead of waiting to the end of it and to get in the bus ride home i used to actually walk home um, i still love walking to this day but i especially liked walking then because i escaped that um, I think my earliest memory when I, when I very first questioned um, those churches was when I was sitting in services one day and I was in my early teens, I might have been 12 or 13 uh, and uh, I seen, there was a minister preaching and there used to be a, a couple of them that would sit on chairs in the background you know, waiting their turn I suppose one of them had a briefcase and uh, I remember he opened up this briefcase and out from inside it, remember this is the, the late 70s, you know, I was born in 65, so if I was in my teens, say 12 or 13, this probably would have been around 1978, 
77, between 77 and 79 anyway. So just to, it's important to know the, the time frame because what this guy pulled out of his briefcase was a cell phone, okay? Late 70s cell phone. You know what they were like? They are like, you know, the size of a small computer. <laughs> These things, you know, the, the whole the briefcase itself, I think, probably housed power and who knows what. And then he pulled out this thing and it's like, you know, side of his head and he's talking on it. And uh, my first my first thought was, uh, this is where the people's money, who's giving money to this church, is going. Now, this thing had to be expensive back then, okay? Um, I think, personally, I think cell phones are expensive now. But can you imagine what the cost of something like that was in the late 70s? You know? Here, this guy pulled it out. My thought was, this is where the people's money's going to this you know, overpriced technology that wasn't necessary. Uh, that really turned me off of it big time, aside from the fact that the services just bored me to the point of, I was literally falling asleep sitting there, literally. I was, uh, just, and I would catch myself and I would go, oh, this is nonsense. It's, I just walked home instead, walked three miles home. So eventually we were, I never gave my thought though. Anyway, it was, uh, we got older, and eventually my mother moved. We moved to a different uh, city to, to where I currently still live to this day in Kingston here. And uh, we lived out in housing again, out in uh, what's called the Rideau Heights, in that war in this city. And uh, the the unit where we lived was right across the street from an evangelist church. So everybody went to the evangelist church every Sunday. And uh, again, bored to tears. That church had so many problems the minister was was actually a really nice guy he was a really soft-spoken kind of a really really nice guy but he could not handle the people in that church there were so many infighting and just jealousy and just all sorts of garbage problems it was about as ungodly as you can get the people in it you know the way they they were acting he had a lot to deal with i remember my mother talking about it but his point i was around i think uh, but at this point I was like I was 14 or 15 uh, my mom did start attending and I think it was around this time she had learned she had got cancer so a lot of people that get cancer suddenly get religious usually she started going to church regularly based. plus my cousins and everybody all went too so you know it was kind of incentive there uh, I went for a little while but then again bored so I stopped going um, but my mother was one time having a big baptism Thing going on there and my mother was concerned that I wouldn't go to heaven with them if I didn't get baptized and so I thought I was all I love my mother deeply so I actually got baptized for her because I didn't want to see her upset uh, it's important to note that because uh, I think within a couple of years of me being baptized some funny things started happening with me so but I got baptized full immersion baptism not sprinkling a little water over somebody's head which isn't baptism um, full immersion baptism in there. I still didn't go to church much, but I was baptized. And uh, it was a while after that, a few years after that, that, uh, oh, there's a few little incidents that happened at the time to, that I just want to call the memory that things that stuck with me that, that made me think, and that was my mom used to have a Ouija board. And uh, they were having a big thing at the church, burning, you know, burning all these sorts of things. So she took her Ouija board, the little part you put your hand on, and my mom used to call it the foot. That mysteriously went missing, and my mother was, like, immaculately clean. She never misplaced anything, so this thing suddenly went missing, which was strange. She took it to church, and then the church, uh, they burned the boards, I guess, and, and I was told, uh, my mom told me when she came back that they heard screams coming out of the fireplace when they burned these things. So that was pretty neat. Um, I personally don't think Ouija boards in and of themselves, the board is evil necessarily, but I think it's what it represents and your reason for buying it is what where the problem lies with those kind of things. And you're definitely inviting demons into your home if you have that kind of thing. Um, I don't, the board itself doesn't cause that. I think it's your own reasons for getting it is what's, it's, what's causing that. And anyhow, that's another subject. But I, I do want to make I do want to bring that up. It's kind of interesting, and, and these kind of things stuck with me. And, you know, it made me think a little bit, but I still didn't mu do much. Um, eventually, my mom, a whole variety of things happened. I went to the armed forces, came back, you know, cursing and swearing every other word. That just seemed to happen when everybody <laughs> go there. 
Uh, the army didn't work out well for me, but uh, I gave it a good shot. I came back from that, and due to a variety of tensions, I couldn't uh, stay at home anymore. I couldn't live at home anymore. I was basically pretty much forced out of my own. So uh, I, I got on welfare, unfortunately, and ended up on my own. And and my mom moved out of the city, so I was left in the city by myself. And then I got in uh, hanging around the wrong people. Except I believed in God and all the rest of that stuff. And But I never, I was like most people, you know, you believe in God. The Sunday churches tell you, just believe and you're saved. And that's all you got to do, you know. Or believe and get baptized and you're saved. And, and, and that's all you got to do, right? So most people, okay, I believe. But, and then you do their own thing, you know. You go, I went out and I got drunk and I'd done the rest of it. You know, I didn't do, I didn't do heavy drugs, that kind of thing. I never liked them, but... I didn't have a lot of sex either, you know. I wasn't the kind of sleep around. It's just I was a one, I've always been a one woman guy. So, but I still I got in with some of the wrong, hanging around some of the wrong people who had more who like to get into more, get into more criminal type things than they should have. I didn't. I never did. I never did that. But they did, and uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, this one. This police pulls over one day, and this guy had something in the bag. I didn't know. I was just walking up the street with him, but he had something he had stolen in it. I had nothing to do with it, but they charged both of us, and I ended up going to jail for that, and I didn't have nothing to do with it. You know, innocent guy put in jail because I was walking with somebody. So uh, there's some good reasons why the Bible tells you not to hang around with people like that, <laughs> and uh, it's a hard lesson to learn, and I learned it, and I didn't quite learn it the first time either. I had two times that happened to me until I learned my lesson, stay away from these people. The day they don't have, you don't have to do anything wrong. You don't have to go along with them. But you can still be charged just for being with them. And nobody's going to believe that you don't know. How many criminals are heard? I didn't know nothing, officer. And how many of you people believe them? <laughs> you're watching one cops or something. You're like, yeah, sure. You know, some of them are being, are being honest. I know I was there. Innocent until proven guilty. Well, they proved me guilty even though I was innocent. But, and this... This is important why I'm mentioning this is because it's, it's a series of things happened to me. I ended up in going to jail, just, you know, a little, uh, what do you call it, detention center, not like a big prison system or whatever, you know, uh, wasn't wearing a yellow, an orange outfit jumpsuit or whatever. But it was for a couple of weeks in jail, and a couple of weeks in jail, if you've never been to jail, it's a couple of weeks too long. It's no fun, not for one day, not for one week, not for any amount of time. So, uh, but I was in, I went to jail. It was in minimum security. And in minimum security, all the people who've never really done much in the way of crime, and it's the first time in jail, all of a sudden think they're real, excuse my language, badasses, you know. <laughs> and so one guy picked a fight with me for reasons I don't know. He picked a fight with me, and uh, I had to defend myself. So obviously I fought back. I, it wasn't nothing big, but it was enough. To get me thrown into a hole, solitary confinement, they call it the hole. This guy actually got it the next day, so he got off scot free. Neil here, who's just defending himself, gets screwed once more. So at this point, you think, you know, <laughs> there's not much of a guy out there looking out for me, right? I mean, uh, this is all happening. I'm bringing it on myself, hanging with the wrong people, but it's really interesting because when I was in solitary confinement in the hole, it, which is a closet size, a little cement room with metal beds and a metal, you know, you weren't allowed to lie down. You had to sit on this metal bench or pace, most people just pace the floor in this room all day. And there was only one book you're allowed to read. The only book you're, the only book you were allowed to read in there was this. The Bible. <laughs> and so, you know, you had to pace the floor and go crazy trying to think for yourself of whatever, or or you sit down and read that. So I sat down and I started reading it on this little bench. And I, I loved it. I actually fascinated with it. it was like, I'd never written it before. Most people have never read it before. you just told what it says by churches, but you never... If you actually sit down and read it, you'll find out it's, uh, a lot of stuff in it is completely different than what a lot of the churches teach, at least the Sunday churches anyway. Um, I don't think a lot of them know their own Bible, to be quite honest. But I read it. I actually ended up, uh, I, when I first started reading it, I read uh, several books of it, uh, you know, uh, the first four or five books of it, I think I read just sitting there, and uh, over over time, years later, I, I have since read it cover to cover, and I've read King James Version cover to cover, so all you King James Version people will be happy about that, first one I read is King James, but... Uh, <laughs> 
uh, I got a new international version, which is done in modern English instead of uh, instead of old English, and uh, and I've, I've read it. And a bunch of versions. I got the new international version, new King James version, King James version, and I don't use the King James version anymore because I wasn't born in the 1600s, um, and so. Uh, I have read it, I've studied it since then, and it's fascinating. I learned a lot from that, and it's like, I now since believe God led me to that place. And I think my baptism might have started the ball rolling. Uh, I don't think what church you get baptized in really matters. I think your your own personal intentions for being baptized, or just being baptized in general, uh, started something. I think I was granted a spirit or something from God because I started uh, believing more stronger, believing what the Bible said. And my mind seemed to be open because I was learning stuff that you just don't learn in churches, just on my own study. But I still wasn't heavily practicing, but I was starting to get open and I was starting to learn. I learned about the truth about Christmas and Easter from a variety of different sources on it. I checked up on what they said, what they taught, and they were they were absolutely right. It was pagan to their core, rotten core. Then I read verses in the Bible where God says he hates man-made pagan traditions. So, you know, I'm, it doesn't take a rocket scientist if God says I, he hates man-made traditions, and then you learn Christmas and Easter is a man-made tradition, then, you know, one plus one equals two in the universe I live in. If God hates it and you're celebrating it, well, you shouldn't be celebrating it. I never, I didn't celebrate it. I stopped celebrating them when I was 17, I think, or so, and I have never celebrated them since. It was around that time uh, that I met my wife, just to get a little further on, and uh, which led me to where I'm at. Uh, I felt madly in love with her. Uh, I used to often, at this time, I was starting to pray to God a lot more. I just, uh, on my own time, talk. I'd walk, go for walk, long walks, do a lot of thinking, I would actually do a lot of praying to God while I was on my walks, and uh, I'd actually prayed to him about her. Actually, when I first asked her to marry me, she actually she said no. So, uh, can you imagine saying no to me? I said. <laughs> but, uh, I prayed about that because I didn't want to lose friends. She was a real good friend. I didn't want to stop being friends with her. So I said, well, if I couldn't marry her, I still wanted to remain friends with her, you know, and I still wished her well and everything. But couple months after I prayed about that, she changed her mind and came back to me. She came to her senses, you know, uh, and seen the error of her ways. And she, uh, she came, she came back to me and changed her mind. So it was interesting. Uh, when we first got married, we moved into our mansion. <laughs> the place we moved into and there was an absolute dive. It was all we could afford. And but there's one thing that was brand new in this whole dive. When I moved in, somebody whoever was there before left a brand new Bible, a leather bound, zippered Bible. Now, how's that for an answer? It's almost like a sign from God about my prayer, you know what I mean? Like a lot of strange things happen over the years. And uh, since we got married, uh, I started, uh, I ran into a few TV programs from certain, uh, some certain preachers and whatnot, ones that taught the truth. I learned, uh, originally learned a lot from Herbert W. Armstrong, but I still, I learned that he had a lot of errors too, and I think for myself, I've always thought for myself, I research, a lot of the ministers will tell you, don't believe me, research your Bible. Well, I learned uh, later on that if you research what they tell you, you find out what that they're wrong, mm, they're not so willing to correct them, their errors. They were like, well, I'm right, doesn't matter. You look up what I say, I'm right, and if you find that I'm wrong, well, I'm right anyway, you know, so, <laughs> a lot of, they taught a lot of truth, they taught a lot of truth, but they also taught a few errors in there, and so, uh, I've stuck with learning things on my own, but there's a few things I learned at, along the way, uh, uh, well, some of, some of the doctrines they used to teach, and I believed for a long time, uh, because of the whole evolution and billions of year universe, I used to believe in theistic evolution, you know, um, and that is that Evolution's true, obviously it's true, right? Because science has proven it true, and the universe is billions of years old, because science has proven that, right? I mean, it couldn't be wrong. So most uh, churches, the way they handle that was they tried to shoehorn evolution and Big Bang and all that into the Bible. So they come up with the idea of theistic evolution, where God is the one who caused evolution to happen over time. And, uh, and Billy, and... Uh, 
uh, uh, later on I dropped the evolution thing, but I did believe that for the longest time, and for even longer I believe, because of the billion year in the universe, um, the Herbert of Armstrong, Gerner of Armstrong, and all the other churches of gods, most of them believe the same thing. They believe that, they don't believe in evolution, but they believe the universe is billions of years old, and that there was a great satanic rebellion before creation, figure that one out, before creation. Um, uh, they destroyed the universe, and in this universe there was an old earth that had dinosaurs and blah, blah, blah. And the reason what destroyed off, killed off the dinosaurs was this satanic rebellion, which destroyed the earth, destroyed the universe. That's why you got craters, etc., etc. And then God had to clean up the mess and recreate it all, and that was the creation you read about in Genesis, and I believe that for the longest time. Again, the, my main problem through all that was because these men taught some truths, I believed the other things they everything they taught then because if they taught teach some truths and everything they teach must be true right that is the first error most people make uh, it's like somebody gives you a good meal beautiful salad maybe some chicken on there or whatever you know and it tastes great and then after the eating you say the whole salad was good but there's I only put a little bit of arsenic in it <laughs> you know you'd be like what well, don't worry. There's only a little bit of arsenic. Well, you know, a little bit of arsenic ruins the whole meal. You know what I mean? Um, just because everything else is good doesn't mean everything in there is good. You know, you look into it. Make sure there's no arsenic in what they're giving you. And I looked into a lot of their beliefs, and I, I get to the point where I start looking these things up, you know. And uh, when I was 15, I think, was the very first time I ever questioned uh Evolution, and it was weird because I was in school, and the teacher asked some question about something related to that. And, um, I don't know what the question was now. I, I honestly can't remember for the life of me, but I know my answer was, uh, uh, "Well, I, my first thoughts were, and I don't even know where this came from. I never even thought of it. I didn't care. It wasn't the kind of thing. I was like everybody else. Who cares, right? You know, whatever. But this just popped in my head, and I was a Start thinking, I was like 15 or so, 14, 15, I don't know, I think Kingston there. And I said, well, what about the eye? How could the eye have evolved, okay? How can you evolve an organ to sense light? If you don't know light exists, you need an eye to see light, right? To know a light exists. How can, how do you evolve an organ to sense something you don't even know exists? And if you somehow could guess that this exists, then how would you go about evolving the eye into, you know, something, or evolving any organ to sense something you don't exist, okay? Let's say there is a fourth or fifth dimension, okay? You don't know one exists, now tell me, how do you go about evolving an organ to sense it? You know, and then how would you do it? And then again, through all this, let's say you could have sensed it, you could, you could somehow guess it's there, you could somehow evolve it, and you could somehow come up with a process to evolve it, what we just got done describing is intelligent thought and reasoning and design which is leading to this being evolved, not seeing the need for it and then creating it, you see. It doesn't make any sense, you know, and the, when you look into the look into the eye and I've looked into these things, it's extremely complex. Any one of those little parts of those that your eye stops working, you're blind. And there's more to the to seeing than just an eye. If you don't have a heart pumping blood to the organ like your eye, you're you're blind, dead. <laughs> if you don't have a mind to receive the signals from your eye, you're not seeing anything. If your mind doesn't have nutrients, which you get from your stomach, which digests your digestive system, sending nutrients there, and which is filtered out through your kidneys and your liver and, and stuff like that, then you're dead, <laughs> but still, I mean, then, you, then your mind ain't working, your mind ain't working, you ain't seeing anything, right? The same thing with your ears, the ears are extremely complex, but all these individual organs, they often will talk about them evolving or something independently, but they can't evolve independently. You can't see unless you have a mind to interpret the signals, to have a whole blood system to, to heal and provide nutrients to all these organs, a nervous system, um, lungs to oxygenate the blood which provides to that, you know, and a heart which pumps 
blood around the lungs was provided, you know, kill the kidneys, liver, all nine nerves, the filter, the digestive system to get nutrients, to get put the stuff into the blood, you know, blue, you know, just, there's so much, but it's all interconnected, and nothing we have here could, could you know, possibly have existed by itself, with maybe the exception of a, an arm or a leg, if you lose an arm or a leg, you can still live, but very, very limited, you wouldn't be living very long, well, without support from somebody else who had arms or legs, would you? If, you, if everybody had, nobody had arms and legs, we'd all die, because nobody would be able to go out and harvest food for us to eat, etc., right? So, uh, those kind of arguments are thrown out, too. So, But that was the first thing, time I ever even gave it any thought, and which that's what made me stop believing in evolution, but I still swallowed the whole billions of years stuff until I looked into it, and uh, found out that uh, there's a lot of evidence out there that the universe is not all. The, you know, the moon's orbit around the sun something you may, you've ne probably never heard, but the moon's orbit is getting f a little bit further away from, from the Earth, not around the sun, around the Earth. The moon is orbiting the Earth, but it's getting a little bit, not much, by a couple inches a year, further away from the Earth. It's decaying, it's getting further away. And what that means, if you go backwards in time, that means the moon is getting closer to the Earth as you go back in time. Now, if you do the math, and I, I'm not a mathematician, but other men have done the math, and they figured out that if you go back in time, based on the current orbit of the moon, and of course as the moon gets closer to the Earth, it gets it's, it that changes everything, the calculations, right? Because it goes gravity and all the rest of it. About approximately a million years ago, the moon would be touching the Earth. Now they're trying to tell us our our solar system is 4.5 billion years old. The moon can't be that old, and none of the theories on how the moon was created uh, make sense. They they. Uh, during the Apollo missions, for example, which did happen, we went to the moon. If you don't believe that, move on. I don't want to hear from you. I'll delete your comments. But the uh, the uh, Apollo missions, part of their missions, were to test a lot of these theories. Though, and they found they had like at the time, um, I think three three different theories, main theories about how the moon formed. One was a it was a giant impact hypothesis where the moon, where some moon was a foreign object hit the Earth. And then fragments of the Earth come off, and then uh, fragments form the Moon. Well, that couldn't have happened because of the, the, because the amount of energy that would have been dissipated by that, the impact, the heat from that impact would have boiled away our, our oceans, right? Also, the Moon would be would be would be formed from materials from our planet. Well, they, when they when they sent the Apollo missions there, they found that the Moon only has some materials that are similar to Earth, but there's materials on it that aren't. So it didn't come from Earth. Uh, we still got all our waters, so it didn't impact. There's no evidence of an impact whatsoever. Other ones was the one where um, some foreign object came in and was caught in the Earth's gravity and got stuck in an orbit. Well, that isn't possible either, because as you get closer to the Earth, it's going to speed up because of the gravity of the Earth is attracting it, and that's actually good. That would actually slingshot an object by the Earth. You, you know, it's either going to impact or it's going to go right on by. In order for it to get caught and end up in an orbit, you have to have an independent energy source like we have on our probes. Uh, some of the probes they spent sent out in space to uh, to go to Mars and stuff like that actually use the gravity of other planets to slingshot by, you know, and they actually calculate all that stuff and I don't even know the kind of minds of men that are able to figure this stuff out. It's incredible, but that is what happens. Anyway, all their theories were proven wrong. The, the moon ha is the moon is proves that our system is young, way younger than a million years old. You'd have problems before the million year mark because as the moon gets close to the Earth, you have huge tidal problems, which, which would have destroyed all the life on the planet, not help it evolve. Um, then you have things called like spiral galaxies, you know, and they're spiraled right now. Well, if the universe was as old as it was, those spiral galaxies are rotating. The inner part's rotating quicker than the outer part. So over billions of years, they would be just a smooth disk. They would have lost their spiral shape, but they haven't. They haven't lost it because they're not old. Uh, there's a whole pile of things like that I looked into. Um, one of the first things I ever looked at that uh, changed my mind was right here. This is the best evidence right here. This is a marvelous machine right here that's designed this hand. You see? See that? Um, 
you got to uh, you look at your own it's got sensors in there that can sense this, this a tiny pinprick on a specific point you know exactly where that pin hit because you got a sophisticated sensor net in there that can sense it you can sense you put take your finger like that you can sense the exact pressure you're pushing in on hard or soft you know it and not only that what else are you sensing touch your hand finger to your hand what are you sensing you can feel temperature you can feel pressure you can feel the precise location you're touching you can feel the texture the the softness or the hardness of what's touching you much details and i take this hand and i can take this hand and i can pick up an egg without even without cracking it you know if i'm careful <laughs> Or I can pick up a tin can and crush it. Or in my case, a paper cup. <laughs> but you can take it and you can crush it with your strength. And the, strong, the more you work on those muscles, the more you use those muscles, unlike machines that wear out as you use them a lot, the human body, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. So you could, you could end up crushing a whole lot more. And I've shook hands with some pretty big-handed, strong people where you're like, <laughs> you know, please don't shake my hand again. But you know, it's a marvelous creation. You got fingernails just allow you to pick things. You know, pick <laughs> pick things and scratch and whatever. And there's so much to it. And individual. It's just it's an incredible thing. But did this happen randomly? Does that sophisticated design with the tendons in there and the muscles, the muscles for your fingers are in here? If you didn't know. You move, you'll feel that, and the tendons are designed to come up through here and to grab and grasp. Did that happen randomly? You know, okay. Let me put it to you this way: If a tornado went through a junkyard, do you think do you think it's possible for that tornado, a tornado going through the junk, a junkyard, to produce a computer, sophisticated computer without any flaws? Now, if you said that to somebody, they would laugh at you. I, I it, where'd you get your computer? Where'd you buy it? Well, I didn't buy it. I went to this, to this junkyard after a tornado went through, and there was a brand new computer sitting there, all sophisticated and running properly, and they would laugh at you and say, you're an idiot. This is right. You are an idiot. If you think something sophisticated, and the computer is, is, isn't nearly as sophisticated as our hand is, and you know, one of them blood cells in our hand, Darwin used to think is just a blob of protoplasm. It isn't. The inside one of those cells is so sophisticated and so inc inc intricately de detailed and designed, more complex than a Boeing 747 inside one blood cell. And how many of them are in this hand? You know. And then you look at the design of the hand. The cells alone blow your mind. And all of those things are operating perfectly, intricately. They're obviously designed. When you see design, when you see a computer, when you see your monitor, your TV, camera, you know, whatever, you know that somebody out there created it. I don't need to meet the person to believe they created it. I'm looking at this creation. Now, how do I know this monitor didn't come together? How do you know your computer didn't come together from a tornado on a junkyard? Well, obviously, the thing is operating in a certain way. It's very sophisticated. Um, everything operates perfectly. You don't see any randomly pieces of junk sticking out the side or whatever, you know, with no use to them. Everything has a use. Everything operates a specific way. Like inside the computer, you got a processor, which manages, uh, does mathematical things. It moves, it moves uh, numbers around between registers and, and from memory into it, and then it shoots off some numbers to your graphic card, which then interprets that and does about a lot of complex mathematics and draws. I know I'm a programmer, so I know all about these things. I know all about how the computer works, but I can't tell you how the human body works. I can't even tell you how one of, one of the blood cells in my body works, and neither can most of the doctors out there, you know. If they could, if they knew exactly how all this stuff worked, then my brother wouldn't wouldn't have died if, uh, a month or two ago, you know. He, he, he'd be alive today, but he isn't alive because they don't know how to fix this simple little thing, you know. He had a blood aneurysm in, his, in the base of his brain or whatever, and it caused a lot of problems. They don't know how to fix that, and you would think, well, that doesn't sound terribly complicated, but they couldn't fix it. You know, they couldn't fix it. My mom had cancer. They couldn't fix that. There's a lot of things they couldn't fix. They tried giving me pills to fix my diabetes. It only made things worse. But I went off the pills and just cut out the things that were damaging myself. And then I'm fine now. I don't want to take pills or anything. But I prayed to God about it for him to heal the damage I did have. And then I cut out the things that helped, that helped lead to that. And in the, and in, and in the long run, that's what helped me the most. The doctors didn't help me. They were giving me pills that actually made, I learned later on that made things worse. You know? So all these things together, you got to think for yourself. Don't let anybody teach you that you're. Don't let everybody make you think that you're stupid. 
you know. You didn't get their education there. Do you want, you want to know what they learned in college and their big vaunted education? They learned that we evolved randomly from Pope, from a blob of goo in an ocean of water. Well, did you know that protein doesn't come together in water? That water actually helps break down protein, so that's literally impossible for that to happen? And even if it did, you need to make, uh, well, five, you need to get enough information together to create this body that would fill enough, that it would fill enough books that would fill, the information that would fill books, enough books that would fill the Grand Canyon several times over, okay? That happened randomly. You know, it's literally impossible for that to happen randomly, okay? Information always comes from an intelligent source. Design always comes from a designer. Always, it's it's a lie. It's it's well known. You know, you won't find a computer system like I said. Uh, tornadoes is my favorite saying. Like I keep saying, it. but tornadoes in junkyards do not produce computers. They don't produce cars. They produce disaster. They destroy everything in in our world is breaking down slowly over time. It's a, it's a law of thermodynamics, actually. It's called the law of entropy. And that's, don't let the fancy words they throw at you uh, confuse you. Entropy just means things are, slowly, things are slowly decaying over time. Real complex, you know. Don't let these scientists and their degrees fool you. They got the, uh, the ones with the bachelors of science is called BS. We all know what BS stands for. And the next level up is a master's, which is MS. More of the same. And then you got PhD, where it's piled high and deep, and that's exactly it. Because the stuff they learn are lies, or it's, or it's foolishness. Then they come out, I'm educated. You're not. You can think. You got a brain. God gave you a brain for a reason. He tells you in your Bible, prove all things. It doesn't say in your Bible, swallow all doctrines. Prove them. Don't sit there just because a man teaches you some truths. Well, you know. This is true. And you look, oh, well, that's true. He taught that. And then he teaches you something else in the Bible. Oh, that's true, too. And then he te starts teaching you a bunch of other things. And you get to this mindset, well, everything else he taught me is true. And I looked that up. And you get lazy. And you think, well, I'm going to believe what he says. Because obviously, he's always proven it. And you start proving it. And, then you, and the next thing you know, you're believing lies. That was my mistake. I've made more mistakes. I believed a lot of lies. I've done a lot of things wrong. I've learned over time not to think. To think for myself. Prove all things, no matter who it is. No matter who it is. I loved and respected Herbert W. Armstrong, but a lot of stuff he done, I learned, especially later on, what I learned was horrible, horrible, horrible. I would never, I said so many times when I learned about what, the way he ran his church, that man, I would have walked out of that church a long time ago, and I never would have looked back because of the way they treated people. They actually disfellowship people. They told, make people believe, if you don't attend my church, you're not going to be saved. Well, that is a load of bull, Okay. It's, that's a PhD. That's piling it high and deep. That is brainwashing people into thinking you got to attend my church or you're not going to be saved. And oh, by the way, you also got to give me a whole pile of your money too, right? What's their thoughts on? Are they are they focused on God and their love, or are they focused on keeping you in their organization and instilling fear into you if you leave and if you don't give them your money? When you see that, you should turn around and go the other direction as fast as you can. This should be your only source of knowledge. Now, you can get other people to help advise you, to open up your Bible with you, look through it, help teach you what it says, help guide you, but don't let them deceive you. John 3.13, for example, says, No man has gone to heaven. How many churches you go to teach, you go to heaven. They're teaching the opposite of what this says. Jesus Christ said, no man's gone to heaven. I've talked to so many people and said to me, well, that just means the body. That's not talking about the soul. So, well, then, okay, you go to heaven and uh, you die and you go to heaven or you go to hell. Heaven forbid, because God loves to burn people forever, right? A loving God loves people to burn forever? What a blasphemous lie. That, that angers me. That is so blasphemous, it's unbelievable. These lies they're teaching. Well, if everybody goes to heaven or if everybody goes to hell and they're judged as soon as they die, then i got a question for you. Who does Jesus resurrect when he returns? Who's still in their graves? Huh? Answer me that, smart guy. Answer it to me from here, too. I don't want to hear your theories, your speculations, or your doc false doctrines. You open this book up and you tell me where, where this says, I go to heaven when I die. It's not in here. Or where you go to hell when you die. It's not in there. Also, what is the else isn't in here? Christmas isn't in here. Easter isn't in here. Um, Sunday keeping isn't in here. 
better read your fourth commandment. And oh, that's right, the commands are done away with, right? They did do away, they can't do away with one of the commandments, so they do away with all the commandments. In order to get rid of the Sunday, in order to get rid of the Sunday, oh, in order to get rid of the Sabbath, right? So then they say all the commands are done away with. So next time someone says that to you, go on to their church. Next time they're passing the plate around, take their plate of money and dump it into your into a bag and walk out and find out how fast they call the cops and have you charged with theft. I bet you they believe you shouldn't steal, right? Well, if you know all the commands are done away with, you should be able to go and rape their wife, steal all their goods into their collection plate, into your bag, and then never go back to church again. Because if the commandments are done away with, then you shouldn't have to go to church. Also, you shouldn't have to tithe them money if the commands are done away with. Should you? Oh, what's right? They believe in those ones because they fill their pockets. Don't be deceived. I've been deceived all my, half my life, most of my life. But I start thinking for yourself. Think for yourself. You don't have to attend. If you can find a church that teaches the truth, by all means, do it. Or, but you can also, in the Bible, most of the apostles, they got get together with people in their own homes. And if you study, you'll find out they actually met with people in their own homes. They, didn't, they weren't all going out robbing the people of their money so they can build big buildings made of gold. They just got together and worshipped together. And you can do that in your own home and it's not evil. And if anybody teaches you, if you don't attend their church, that you're, that you're not going to be saved, then tell them, you know, and then I'm not going to be attending this church because after teaching you a lie, and you don't, and you don't want to be le learning lies. L think for yourself. Anyway, very lengthy. I wanted to go into a little bit of detail why I believe the way I do. I don't believe the way I do for no reason. I thought the way I saw. I think for myself. I research this stuff, and uh, and I try to act on it as best I can. I'm not perfect by a long shot, but I'm not going to sit there and have anybody lying to me or. Or whatever. I still got a lot to learn as well. But don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. Think for yourself. Open your Bible up and read it and believe exactly what it says. And don't let anybody tell you it doesn't mean what it says. John 3.13 means what it says. No man has gone to heaven. It says that. I bet you've never heard that in your church. Open up your Bible. Read it. And don't believe. Listen to anybody else. Just read it. Do you, will you believe what it says? Will you believe the part in the Bible that says... When Jesus returns, everybody's still in their grave. But I thought they were in heaven. Well, you show me in the Bible where it says they go to heaven. You won't find the word and say, and say that. They'll say, oh, the kingdom of God. Blah, blah. You know, research it. Does it say that? It doesn't. It tells you to keep go to church. It tells you to keep the Sabbath day holy. And it tells you God. Jesus Christ himself said, if anybody comes to you and teaches you not to obey the commandments, and they're a liar and the truth ain't in them. So just ignore that when you go to Sunday church. We don't want to hear that, <laughs> you know, because the minister won't like it. Anyway, I'm rambling on here, but these things you can tell bugs me. But I just want to give something, give a bit of an idea of why I believe the way I do and how my thinking processes work. And I don't know why I think the way I do to this day. Um, all I can figure is something in that baptism changed me and God started working working with me and changed my mind and so in order to think the right way or something. I haven't got a clue. My father's an atheist. <laughs> my mother never attended church. She only attended Sunday church when she got cancer. So it's not like I've come from a background of uh, church, church keepers. You know. So anyway, think for yourself. Think for yourself. Use your mind. God gave you a mind. Use it. Study the Bible. You're not stupid. You're smart. You can learn this stuff. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. If they do, walk away from them and don't ever talk to them again. Don't attend. Don't let any church teach you. You have to go to their church in order to be saved because that is a bunch of baloney. What church did Abraham attend? What church did Noah attend? What church did any of these great men of the past attend? But I tell you right now, they're all saved. Okay? Now, even they, didn't most, they didn't even know Jesus, did they? They didn't attend church. They didn't keep Christmas and Easter, I can tell you that much. And they didn't keep Sunday either. Anyway. Anyway, goodbye. God bless.